So I'd like to give you a system of techniques for getting more out of every single minute that you spend training. And <laughs> this should go without saying, but high level basketball skill development is going to take a lot of reps over a long period of time. And it's the player who gets the most out of every single rep that they do in the gym who's going to improve the fastest and who's going to win in the long run. We've all seen players who work and work and work at their game and they never seem to get any better. After I share these techniques with you, I think it's going to shed a little bit of clarity on why that might be and why there's so much wasted effort and wasted time in the gym in so many players' programs. And uh, I'll also say that as I was studying uh, and researching for this talk, there were some brand new techniques I'd never come across that are, are pretty unique that uh, I've been seeing significant results with. And uh, <laughs> I, I say this only because I'm excited to share these with you. And I think that these can radically improve the rate of progress at learning new moves, learning new techniques, new skills, um, whether that's on the basketball court, of course, or even if you're learning a new instrument, if you're learning a new language, if you're studying something uh, in, in school and you want to retain more information in a shorter period of time, these techniques apply across the board. So super interesting stuff here. And uh, to kick this off, I'll say that in the spirit of an investor who puts a dollar into an investment and wants the highest return possible back, if he can get $2 or $3 back, that's a really good return. As high-level basketball players, we want the highest return possible on every moment we spend in the gym. So if you can get, let's say, a 2x return or a 3x return on every rep that you do compared to a player who gets like a 1.25 or 1.5x return, you're going to improve exponentially faster. And guys are going to look at you and say, hey, he spends 90 minutes a day in the gym. I spend five hours. Why is he improving so much faster? Well, this is why if you practice the art of skill development and learning at an accelerated rate, you're going to accelerate past those around you who are potentially even putting in more time in the gym. So I will kick this off with maybe the <laughs> a slightly less interesting technique, but I have to say this one first because it's probably the most important, okay? And if you've been doing this deep game work for any length of time, you already know this one, but it's simply presence, okay? The law of present states, this is the very first law <laughs> of the deep game. It states that performance increases as thought decreases, meaning the less your mind is wandering while you're going through your workout doing reps, the less your mind is wandering and the more present you are on every single rep, the faster you're going to learn that skill and the more, uh, you know, the, the more you're going to get out of every single rep that you do. And this is pretty obvious, right? But it turns out there is uh, some scientific backing to this statement. So uh, credit for this information goes to Andrew Huberman, who's a great resource and, and uh, several of these, these techniques actually came from him. It turns out that when we focus in on something, our brain releases a neurochemical called acetylcholine, which essentially triggers to the brain or tells the brain that this thing is important, focus on it and remember it. So on a neurochemical level, if you're really present during a rep, your brain is going to be releasing more acetylcholine, which is going to drive it deeper into your neurology, into your nervous system, into your brain, and make it that much easier to actually use when it comes time to do it on the court during a game. So you're going to literally get more out of every single rep on a, on a neurochemical level if you're present during your training. And this is why, uh, just to like wrap this up, up with a really quick story, um, I believe this is in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Kobe was on a trip to China and he was putting a group of Chinese basketball players through a 4 a.m. workout. So they stumble into the gym, they're all groggy-eyed, they're, they're obviously kind of sloppy, like they're half asleep. And they're so sloppy during this workout that after 15, 20 minutes, Kobe calls a stop to it. He says, stop. That was terrible. That was terrible. Okay, you got to clean this up, sharper angles. He's giving them instruction. And uh, of course, they're, they're wide-eyed now because Kobe just told them they suck, essentially. So they, they kind of get it together. And at this point, Kobe says to them, listen, it's not about how much you're training. 
It's about how present your mind is while you're training. And this is a principle, I don't know if Kobe understood the science behind this and the acetylcholine that's released, but he understood on a deep level that the more present you are during training, the more you're going to get out of every single rep. All right, so uh, that's the first sort of foundational technique that I'm going to give here. We're going to get into more uh, sort of sexier and more interesting techniques now, but I have to say that one first because it's really the foundation. The second technique that I'll offer you, I've actually been using this since I was a kid, uh, believe it or not, and this is frequency and micro practice. So the more frequently that you practice a given skill, the faster it's going to develop. Meaning if you spent, let's say you're working on a certain aspect of your shooting form and uh, you practice that, for the sake of this example, this is what I actually did when I was younger. If you did one hand form shooting for five minutes, five times per day, you would get dramatically better results than if you practice that same drill for 25 minutes once per day, even though the total volume is still just 25 minutes either way, breaking it up into five uh, separate sessions so you're doing it more frequently is going to get you faster results. And it turns out that skill development responds better to frequency than to volume. This is why um, Olympic lifters and bodybuilders, if they are, uh, well, for example, we'll go with Olympic lifters, I remember back in high school studying the Olympic lifting training programs that they used in the Soviet Union. And they would have guys who were competing in the clean and jerk and the snatch. They would have them doing these movements with heavy weight up to three times per day in the Olympic training center. That's crazy, okay? Doing a clean and jerk and a snatch, if you did that like once per day, you'd be torched or most people would be. But these Olympic athletes were doing it three times per day to keep on driving the frequency that they were performing that skill at, okay? So I call this now micro practice. You can do this with uh, in, in a lot of different ways. I just mentioned the form shooting example. If you're working on your shooting form and you really want to develop like a certain aspect of it, let's say keeping your elbow under the ball, you can go out on the driveway for five minutes per day and just do one hand form shooting for five minutes, five times per day. If you are learning meditation. This is a really powerful way to accelerate the practice that you're doing. Let's say you practice for uh, 20 minutes once per day. If you also sink into meditation for one minute every hour or so throughout the day, which is really nothing, right? Just stop, pause, focus on the breath for even 30 seconds to one minute. You're going to see substantial results. All right, so, and this goes for any skill that you wanna develop. If you're learning the guitar, maybe you practice chords for five minutes, five times per day. There's, it's not adding a whole lot. Like it sounds like a lot five times per day, but it's just a few minutes here and there. And that can, again, radically accelerate the rate of skill development that you get. Um, Make sure that you're only doing this for one thing at a time, okay? You don't wanna practice a whole bunch of skills for five, t- five times per day. It can get to be a lot, so focus on one thing at a time, and we'll, we'll get into this later on in this talk. You don't wanna be learning too many things that are brand new all at once. Um, again, we'll focus on this later. But for your micro practice, choose one thing, focus on it for a month, for two months, for however long you feel is needed until you get the result that you want. Uh, and do that multiple times per day in addition to the training that you're already doing. Okay, so keep everything else the same, just add this in. Um, The next one is super interesting, okay? So I will uh, share a quick story before I share the technique. I was at a monastery in Vermont that's uh, run by this Zen monk who trained in Japan for, I believe, 20 years. And he started this monastery in in Vermont. I'm doing, excuse me, I'm doing a meditation retreat there. We're sitting in meditation for most of the day. And he told this story about these Zen monks that he trained with in Japan who would do this thing. They called it stopping on a dime, okay? They would be going throughout their day, like cleaning the dishes, doing chores around the monastery, going about like various tasks that they had to do. And spontaneously throughout the day, they'd stop on a dime and just do nothing. When they did nothing, they literally would do nothing for let's say 10 seconds, a minute at a time. And then they'd go right back to doing the thing that they were doing. And it was this strange like bouncy quality of of, like uh, 
going throughout tasks and then stopping, going throughout tasks and then stopping. And they would do this in addition to the, of course, the traditional meditation that they were already doing. This is a form of micro practice that they're, that they're, uh, that they're using for themselves. They'd sink into meditation spontaneously, but it turns out if we apply this to our workouts, if you stop on a dime and spontaneously pause in the middle of a drill or in the middle of a workout multiple times during that workout, what science shows is that the motor neurons in our brain are replaying what we just did. They're downloading the information at something like 20 times the speed. So for example, let's say you do a drill where you're you're taking 10 shots from, a, from the wing, all right? On, uh, 10 threes from the wing for the sake of this example and after the seventh shot you just spontaneously paused and for 10 seconds you just did nothing you're not thinking about something you're not like letting your mind wander you're not staring off into the distance you're not talking with a friend you're actually doing nothing during that time your brain is downloading the first seven shots and all of the movements that the nervous system made during those first seven shots at 20x the speed then you go right back to shooting. These spontaneous pauses, it turns out, accelerate skill development from what you're, uh, accelerate skill development compared to not doing the pause at all. So you can apply this, again, spontaneously pausing throughout the day, sinking into meditation if you wanna do that, throughout your workout, while you're doing a drill, just spontaneously pausing and doing nothing for five to 10 seconds, and then going right back to it. This will drive the skills that you're developing deeper into your nervous system, into uh, your neurology, your brain, so on and so forth, into your memory. And the same goes if you're doing your homework and you're studying for a test and you're studying, 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 and then you just stop 10 seconds and then go right back to it. Your brain is actually downloading the information at hyperspeed during that pause. So Try that out. That was one of the cooler ones that uh, I've learned. I, I've I practiced it a little bit after that retreat and I heard that story and I'd go into meditation spontaneously and I was seeing really interesting results from that. I unfortunately never applied it during a basketball workout for myself, but I'm super curious to hear your results with it. So definitely let me know. That was one of the um, more fascinating examples. I uh, kind of piggybacking on that one from the spontaneous pausing in uh, the same way that our brain is downloading information during those pauses what we want to do is give ourselves white space a blank space where we do nothing at the end of a session so at the end of a workout uh, same goes if you're studying if you are practicing guitar and trying to learn guitar after your micro skills practice we want to give ourselves empty space to do nothing you, you know you can like of course if at the end of a workout you can stretch or whatever but for the most part we want our mind to be still during this period of time uh, it can be anywhere i i think five minutes is typically sufficient up to 10 minutes or 15 minutes even give ourselves space to do nothing meaning no conversations not scrolling on instagram not texting somebody back not on the phone not on a phone call not wandering around daydreaming but actually just doing your best to do nothing for that that period of time within which our brain is going to be again downloading the information from the workout from the study session from the practice session that we just did so it's really important here that you don't interrupt that download by pouring a bunch of new information in. If you go straight from your workout onto your phone and now you're texting your girlfriend, now you're scrolling on TikTok or Instagram, you're interrupting the download and you're actually shortchanging yourself. You're like, uh, you know, if let's say the investor gets a dollar fifty back for his dollar. He just like takes 25 cents and gives it right back. <laughs> He's losing 25 cents off that 150. This is kind of what you're doing by interrupting the download. So we want empty space for five to 10 minutes at the end of the session. I think it's, um, uh, of course, this wasn't studied, but my uh, hypothesis anyway is that if you're doing a micro practice, so five minutes of form shooting probably requires a, a shorter period of white space. I haven't verified this, but this is what I think. Uh, so two to three minutes at the end of uh, a micro practice would be uh, beneficial for sure. You definitely don't want to go from a micro practice straight into scrolling on your phone. Um, make sure that you give yourself that white space. And I will also say that 
The same goes for sleeping and waking up, okay? This is a really big one. And we've been talking about this uh, as a foundational habit in deep game that we make all of our players do. If you go through the deep game program, you will be required to do this for the first and final hour of the day. We don't want any social media whatsoever. And ideally, we don't want excessive input of any kind. So you don't watch Game of Thrones and then immediately go to bed or immediately wake up and start scrolling on your phone. We leave the first and final hour of the day more or less empty, okay? And that means, of course, you can wake up and do your meditation practice or your training or whatever the case may be. But we don't want to be putting in external input like social media, books, conversations, uh, sorry, books. Um, books are a bit of a different story. I don't want to go off on a tangent on that. That It gets a bit more complicated. Um, but the reason that we do this is because when we go to sleep, our brain is actually processing a lot of what we did during the day. So if you put in a lot of good work, let's say you did, had several workouts on the schedule, you had a meditation session in the morning and you go to sleep, your brain is then downloading all of that information and processing it to a higher degree while you sleep. When you wake up in the morning, that's the space where, uh, to use a, an Andrew Huberman quote, you're receiving the download. So if you immediately wake up and do what most players do, which is roll over, grab their phone and start scrolling through Instagram, you're interrupting the download once again, and you're shortchanging yourself and robbing yourself of results that you would be getting otherwise from all that work that you just did. So the first and final hour of the day are empty space or productive space where you're either putting good things into your mind, which uh, again, we don't want to... Um, by good things, I mean meditation, training, uh, things of that nature. We're not putting in social media, television, um, conversations with friends, anything like that. And the reason why we don't do this for, uh, or we don't put anything in the final hour of the day is because as we get ready to go to sleep and our, our, uh, our brain starts releasing melatonin and our body winds down, there's this sort of uh, malleability to the brain. It's, uh, it's almost as though, um, this is just an analogy, but a portal opens up between the conscious and unconscious mind. And anything that you put into your brain just before you go to sleep is going to be uh, is going to sink deeper into your unconscious mind. If you've ever watched a really dramatic TV show and then gone to sleep, you might dream about it. You might wake up in the middle of the night with like images of that television show um, in your mind, and you can't stop thinking about it. It's for that reason. It gets driven deeper into your mind. So we want to make sure that. In that final hour before bed, we're only putting in things that we actually want in there. You can read like uh, spiritual books, philosophy books that are really light. You don't want to be reading anything supercharged or really dramatic. No, uh, again, no Game of Thrones before bed or anything like that. Be really, really careful with what you're putting into your mind. And I would suggest no social media whatsoever for that final hour of the day, as well as, of course, the first hour of the day, as we discussed. So... Put your phone on airplane mode during those times. Um, make sure that you're really caring for the downloads and for the work that you did, that you're receiving the downloads fully and not wasting um, you know, pieces of that training that you might otherwise get results from. Uh, so we have white space during, or, or rather white space after the session. We have white space for the first and final hour. One more really interesting one is that if you spike adrenaline, if you spike adrenaline through something like cold exposure after a workout, it turns out <laughs> that that adrenaline spike allows a lot of the information that you process during the workout, a lot of the information from the workout or what, you know that you were studying or whatever the case may be, it allows that information to drive deeper into your nervous system, into your brain. And there's been scientific studies on this. There's also been even like, I heard about stories from medieval times where parents would be teaching their kids something and then throw them in the river, in the cold river to shock them and shock their system. And what I can only theorize about what this does, I'm not a neuroscientist, but 
what seems to happen is that that neurochemical release, the adrenaline that's released immediately after learning something sort of uh, drives the download of that information deeper into the nervous system. And so a simple way to practice this is just take a cold shower after training. You may already be doing this, but this is uh, crank that water as cold as it'll go to, to actually shock the system after training and do this for a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And this will actually improve the rate of learning from the training itself. Um, we will, by the way, go back through these. I'll recap at the end. So if you are uh, not taking notes and you want to remember what we've spoken about, I'll recap all of these because I know we've discussed a lot. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is something called the 85% rule. And this states that you want to be challenging yourself at a level that errors are made about 15% of the time. Okay. This means that errors, that failure, like mistakes, are actually a critical part of the learning process. Without any mistakes, you're not giving your, your brain and your nervous system enough feedback to make adjustments with. You need to actually feed errors into the system so that it knows what not to do. So if you're doing a ball handling drill, go at a speed that challenges you to make mistakes about 15% of the time. If you're... Uh, you know, if you're frankly, if you're scrimmaging or playing a pickup game or even during a real game and you make a mistake, enjoy that and celebrate that internally because that is more data that you're feeding into your brain to not make that mistake again the next time. Okay. So the errors are part of the learning process and they're critical to the learning process. So we want to optimize our, our training so that we're making uh, mistakes about 15% of the time. And that, that seems to be the sweet spot. Of course, we're not like, uh, we're not over analyzing this during our training. We're just challenging ourselves and making sure that we're actually giving ourselves the ability to make, to make mistakes uh, through that challenge. This is what's going to get you the most out of that training. So uh, finally, I, I've, uh, I've mentioned this already, but I want to mention it again. Don't try to learn too many new things at once. To optimize the rate of progress from your training and from anything that you're learning, you could kind of envision this as downloading too many apps on your computer at the same time. If you download too many apps or you're downloading like too many videos, the system crashes or all the downloads go much slower. All right, so what we want to do to optimize our rate of learning is choose the thing that's going to get you the most results and, and has the highest leverage in your game. If like you just can't keep your elbow under the ball during your jump shot and your, your form is kind of jacked up and it's causing you to miss, maybe you decide to focus on one hand form shooting and just, just do that. Okay, do micro practice throughout the day on top of the training that you're already doing. Of course, this doesn't mean that we only do the one hand form shooting and we just like stop doing all the rest of our training because we don't want too much new information at once. No, 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 no. I'm saying that you don't want to put this hyper focus on too many new things at the same time. We want to give uh, our, our mind enough space to download this new information and to process it at the highest speed possible. So choose, my advice is just choose one thing. Focus on that one thing, apply to it things like uh, frequency and micro practice just to that one thing. And then after, you know, a month, two months, whenever you're satisfied, choose a new thing and then focus on that. If you're trying to learn a new language, don't also try to learn the guitar. <laughs> if you're trying to learn Spanish, don't also try to learn Japanese at the same time. Focus on one thing until you've got that online, then introduce another thing. Okay. Uh, that's my strong advice to you as far as the other techniques that we spoke about. And I want to run through these right now. Um, of course we spoke about presence that applies to every single thing that you do. Uh, spontaneous pausing. You can apply that as often as you want throughout all of your skill training. You don't have to like apply that only to one particular skill, uh, white space after sessions, meaning you, uh, as we said, you don't like immediately go on Instagram or social media or have conversations with, with people straight after your training session and interrupt the download from that. 
you can apply that all the time. And I would advise you like really be careful about that after studying, after homework, after a class, after a workout, after uh, reading a book, after a meditation session, give yourself at least five to 10 minutes of white space to download that information. And white space just means not doing a whole lot of anything. You can like go about one way that I'll do this. I'll be working for an hour or so. Let's say I'm outlining one of these talks. Then I go upstairs and I make some tea and I I, I don't watch YouTube ideally. Sometimes I do, <laughs> but when I'm being good and most of the time, thankfully I do, uh, I go upstairs, I'll make some tea, I'll walk outside, I'll do a couple stretches and I'll come back down. That's white space. You don't need to literally sit there and do nothing. You can just go throughout your day, uh, have that break period, but uh, don't be taking in new stuff is what I'm saying. Um, so we have the spot, we have the presence, we have spontaneous pauses, we have white space after sessions. We also spoke about giving yourself that first and final hour uh, of the day, not putting a whole lot into your mind unless it's really high quality material, being really careful about what it, what you're putting into your mind during that time. And particularly when you first wake up in the morning, um, it's really important not to be interrupting the download with a whole bunch of new information. Allow the all that work that you did to process fully and to download fully into your nervous system. We have cold exposure immediately after. If you are doing a really intensive study session at the very end of that, jump in a cold shower for three minutes. That will actually help you to remember that information on a deeper level, believe it or not. This is scientifically proven. If you do this after training, same thing goes on a physical level. Your body will remember what you did on a deeper level with that adrenaline spike from the cold exposure immediately after training. And of course, this means you can do um, you can do like an ice bath if you want. Same thing applies. You'd actually get better results from an ice bath. And uh, we also spoke about the 85% rule. This applies across the board. Um, challenge yourself to make mistakes about 15% of the time. If you're going over 15%, and I, again, I know that you're not like meticulously studying the game tape, just, just feel this out. If it feels like you're making too many mistakes too frequently, maybe it's too much of a challenge. You back off until you get to that 15% range, but make sure you're allowing yourself to make mistakes. Challenge yourself at that clip. Otherwise, you're not feeding enough, uh, enough data into your system of what not to do. All right, and learning will slow as a result. Now, with all of those points in mind, I know that was a lot of information. What I wanna, what I wanna wrap this up with is a way to look at the learning process and the process specifically of achieving mastery in anything that you do, whether that's basketball or any any field that you wanna master. Learning and the road to mastery is very rarely linear, meaning you don't get, you don't see uh, improvements happen in a straight line like this. Very, very rarely. In the early days, there can be beginner's gains where you're like making progress every single day. But after a period of time, you'll notice that there's uh, something more like a stepladder to learning. Okay, so there will be times when you feel like you're not making any progress at all. There's this like plateau where a, a few weeks, a month goes by, maybe a few months if you're more advanced, and it's like, oh, not, not much is happening right now. And then you wake up one day and all of this new information has come online and you make this rapid increase in learning over the course of uh, a week, two weeks, a month, however, the, however long uh, it is, it depends. And then there's another plateau. And this is a lot more what the journey to mastery looks like. We used to use an analogy in the old days, like the EGTX days. <laughs> Some players will remember this analogy. Uh, I called it filling the cups, okay? Making progress and the journey to mastering a skill is sort of like filling a series of cups. Each cup is larger than the last one. And each day you're making drops into a cup. Just drop by drop by drop, one workout, drop, one lifting session, drop, one meditation session, drop. And one drop at a time, you're filling a cup until uh, suddenly, and if we're looking at the cup at, at eye level, we're not actually seeing any water. 
right? We're not seeing any, it's like, okay, I'm filling this thing, but I don't know what's happening. I, it seems like I'm putting in work. I don't know how, how much better I'm getting. And then suddenly the water reaches the level of the cup and it overflows and you get all of this result. And once you've overflowed one cup, the next cup takes its place and you begin doing one drop at a time, one drop at a time, one drop at a time. And now you're like, oh, I was making all that progress. The last cup overflowed. Um, why am I not seeing that same progress again? Well, this is a bigger cup and you've got to one drop at a time, fill it up, fill it up, fill it up until finally, when you're not sure if anything's happening, there's a like stretch of time where you're putting in work and oh, I don't know, then it overflows. <laughs> and the further along the road to mastery you go, the longer the plateaus are because the bigger the cups are that you have to fill. But the bigger the cup is, the bigger the overflow and the bigger the leap in development that comes ultimately. So in the beginning, you're filling these tiny little cups and they're overflowing one day after the next. Over time, those results seem to slow, but it's really just a bigger cup that's being filled. And finally, once that overflows, you see these big spikes in performance. And again, what I said was a stepladder. Learning is not linear. If you expect this, you're gonna be frustrated and a lot of players are gonna give up. If you understand that it's just one drop at a time, you don't know when the results are gonna come, but eventually they will come. Before you know it, years will have gone by and you will have attained real genuine mastery of a skill. And I, I still remember one of my early meditation and Qigong teachers, uh, his name's Bruce Francis. I was living in Maui uh, for a time and I was training in person with Bruce and we're learning this form of standing meditation, which was quite difficult. It was, well, it is quite difficult, but it was especially difficult for me at the time. I found it very like physically taxing and uh, my knees would hurt and I'd be like, oh, I don't know how to do this. And my body's all tight. And, and uh, one day I was especially frustrated and I remember Bruce saying something to me that I'll, I'll never forget. He goes, you know, this standing practice really separates those who are serious from those who aren't because for a long time, it won't feel like you're, you have a hope at learning this thing. And maybe a year or two years will go by and you have no idea if you're getting any better. But two years from today, if you do it every single day consistently, you will wake up and suddenly you will be able to do it effortlessly. And you will be fundamentally changed when that happens. And I was like, oh, right, okay. I can totally get on board with that. Of course, like I spent 10 years mastering uh, jump shooting I, is one thing that I feel like I genuinely mastered. I didn't master the game of basketball, but jump shooting I, I did. And because I had that sort of background of um, like knowing what that feels like, I just set out on the road to mastering that standing form. And I won't say that I mastered it, but I will say that after a few years of consistent practice, there was a time when I suddenly I woke up and I was just doing it and my body was strong and open and the energy was moving smoothly through my body. And I was like, Bruce was right. <laughs> and if you approach your learning and your skill development and your mastery ultimately of the game of basketball in that way, not expecting these results constantly, just forget all about the results and just put one drop in at a time practice what we spoke about here focus your mind on what you're doing be as present as you can possibly be during every single moment that you spend on this incorporate the spontaneous pauses give yourself white space after training jump in the cold shower for three minutes after you are uh, I, i'm not saying again <laughs> i want to the, there's a caveat that's coming to mind here you don't have to take a cold shower after every single micro practice. So if you do one hand form shooting five times a day, don't take a cold shower after every single one. That's not necessarily just, just do it after your big workouts. Um, <laughs> that just came to mind. Sorry, not to get off track. Uh, incorporating the spontaneous pauses, the white space after sessions, the first and final hour of the day, really being careful with what you put into your mind, doing the cold exposure, the 85% rule, not trying to learn too many things at once, focusing on one thing in addition to your regular routine, and then once that's online, then introducing a new thing, and uh, really only doing micro practice and frequency for one thing at a time is a good idea, and then just 
take this approach of consistently putting drops in the cup and not, not thinking about has it overflowed yet, but have I put a drop in today? And as long as a drop goes in, it doesn't matter if it's overflowed because that's eventually going to happen as a result of putting drops in. All that matters is the drops, <laughs> okay? So take that analogy or take that analogy to heart. And I will finish this up by saying that those who are ultimately successful in this game, and I've seen so many players over the past, it's been 12 years now since the first uh, online training program I ever released dropped. So we've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of players come through these programs and, uh, you know, with varying degrees of success, frankly, players who do a ton of work and get a ton of result and see like incredible things happen in their basketball career. And then players who kind of fizzle out and the training just doesn't take and it just doesn't quite happen for them. And one of the critical differences between the two are the players who fizzle out and don't really quite ever get the results that they're looking for, even if they're working hard. And those who are super successful is that the players who don't get the result think in terms of weeks and months. The players who are super successful in the long term are thinking in terms of years and decades. They're playing the long game and they're applying this road to mastery uh, as a multi-year project. So that's my advice to you is whatever skill that you're developing, think of it in terms of uh, years and potentially even decades. Hopefully, if all goes well in your basketball career, your game is going to be a multi-decade project. And if you keep on putting drops in the cup <laughs> for decades, mastery is an inevitable result. It would be unreasonable for you not to be successful. All right, and that is my wish for you. So I hope that you got a ton out of this. Let me know what happens as you begin applying some of these techniques. I would love to hear your results. Um, if one of them particularly stands out to you and you're like, wow, I got great results from that. I would really like to hear that, whether that's in the comments below or um, if you wanna reach out to us anytime, support at deepgamebasketball.com. Definitely, definitely, please let us know. I would love to hear it. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that one and I will see you in the next video. Okay, so it turns out we're not done yet. <laughs> I've got a quick bonus for you that came to mind actually just a few hours before we were scheduled to post this talk that I couldn't get out of my mind. I just have to add this because it's probably one of the biggest deciding factors of how fast you progress in your skill development and how fast you learn anything for that matter. And I'll call this optimizing your training for enjoyment. Okay. Optimizing your training for enjoyment. And there's a really beautiful story that encapsulates this from BJ Penn, who's a former UFC fighter, one of the all-time greats, and particularly one of his specialties in his game was his jujitsu. And when he started Brazilian jujitsu, he took to it so quickly and enjoyed it so much that he progressed from being a raw white belt, you know, first foot in the door to being a black belt and winning the Mundials, which is the world championship in jiu-jitsu in three years. <laughs> now, for those who don't know anything about jiu-jitsu, that might not mean a lot, but typically the path from white belt to black belt for somebody that's really serious is about 10 years minimum, and most often it's longer than, than even 10 years. And not only did he reach black belt status, he won the world championship. So he's beating the best of the best of the best in three years. And the reason I bring this up is because when he tells this story, he says, people ask him all the, all the time, was it discipline or was it, you know, confidence or was it um, dedication or any of these things? Was it work ethic? And he goes, no, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. He couldn't help but do it. He couldn't help but be on the mats all day long, learning and training and testing and tweaking new, new ideas and new moves. He couldn't help it because it was so enjoyable for him. And that state of enjoyment 
is really one of the deeper meanings of law number seven in the deep game. And the law, law number seven is the law of mastery, of course, which states the game rewards the player who needs no reward other than the game itself. In other words, the more that you deeply enjoy the process of your training and of learning whatever skill you're learning, the more open your mind is going to be to receive that training. It's almost as though your mind becomes like an open sponge to soak up all of this information on a much deeper level. Whereas if you're kind of forcing yourself to do things that you don't really enjoy in your training, which is sometimes necessary, and I'll get into uh, some of the nuances here in a moment, because you've got to be careful with this, of course. But if you're forcing your mind to or, or forcing yourself to do things that you absolutely hate and you dread going in there and you don't want to do it day after day, it's like a, a dry sponge that can't absorb any water. You're not actually going to be fully utilizing that training and uh, downloading it into your system, so to speak. Now, <laughs> the very first thing that's going to come up, I know, is, well, we all have to do things that we don't like to do. We have to push through discomfort and challenge ourselves. And yes, of course, okay, of course, you need to do skill work. You need to be working on your jump shot, on your handle, on your scoring moves. You need to get in the weight room. You need to be doing uh, some form of conditioning, even if that's just playing full court. There are basics that have to be covered. We need to be doing deep game training. So some form of meditation and all of the practices that we speak about in these talks and in the program, all of that's necessary. But within those larger categories, there are so many ways to train <laughs> that there's really no excuse not to be doing training that you deeply enjoy. And I had a friend over here, um, one of my closest friends, who has been getting into knees over toes training, which I actually am a huge fan of. And we were talking about the ATG split squat, which is essentially a split squat with your knees over your toes. And he was saying to me, you know, it just doesn't feel right. I don't like it. I don't look forward to it. Like my body doesn't feel good after I do it. I, I, maybe I'm doing it wrong. And, and what I said to him, and for the record, I actually really like that movement. I like Ben a lot. I love his training. I recommend it all the time. But in the case of my friend, he was saying, it's, it just doesn't feel good. I don't like it. And so my recommendation to him was don't do it. There's so many movements in the weight room and Ben, I'm sure would be the first to tell him there's a lot of ways to accomplish the same goal. So as long as you're focused on the goals that you need to accomplish within your training, there are infinite ways of getting to those goals. And so a, optimize your training and the work that you're doing in all, in all aspects for your enjoyment of it. You should be ideally designing training that you're looking forward to. That doesn't mean you're like bouncing into the gym absolutely overjoyed every single day. There's days where you gotta discipline yourself and just you know shut up and do it, and we all have those days. But more often than not, you should be enjoying your training. And the first time I, I mentioned this principle, I uh, was met with a Muhammad Ali quote from one of our players. And he was like, well, Muhammad Ali had that famous quote that said, I, and I'm paraphrasing here, I'm going to butcher the quote because I don't have it written down. But it's something to the tune of, I hated every second of training, but I reminded myself, suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. So he's implying that he hated every second of his training. And I can't say for certain, of course, whether or not that was true, but I will offer to you, study Muhammad Ali's life, <laughs> okay? If you haven't studied Muhammad Ali's life, you cannot take what he says too seriously. I have studied his life. <laughs> if you read through his biographies, he said wild stuff <laughs> throughout his career. And he was actually quoted once, I forget the exact percentage that he said, but it was something to the tune of when a reporter asked him in private, and this is in his biography, uh, Ali, the reporter asked him how much of what you say is, is actually true. And he kind of giggled and winked and he's like, yeah, probably about 25%. He said the craziest stuff. And if you go back through everything he said, a lot of it was for effect. And a lot of it, he would just had this huge charismatic personality and he would say whatever sounded best in the moment. And he was a very controversial figure in his time. We appreciate him much more now, but during his time, there was a, a period of years where, and this is a direct quote from the biographer who wrote uh, the famous biography Ali, he was the most hated man in America. 
All right, believe it or not. So you've got to go back and do your research here. So <laughs> I know people are going to meet me with that Muhammad Ali quote, and I will just say, study Muhammad Ali's life because <laughs> he said a lot of stuff. And I find it really hard to believe personally that if he became as great as he truly was, and I do believe he was great, one of the greatest athletes in history, perhaps the greatest, I find it really hard to believe that he actually hated his training, okay? Okay. And whether or not he did, it's much better to love your training. <laughs> it's objectively better because your mind and nervous system, your entire like uh, being is going to soak up that training on a much deeper level. And you know this to be objectively true if you just look at your own life. What are the subjects in school that you do best at? What, what are the ones that you excel at the fastest? Well, it's the subjects that you enjoy because you go in with an open mind looking forward to learning the information and receiving it fully and contemplating it and, and exercising it rather than the subjects that you go in like, oh, okay, I've got to do this again. All right, let's, let's just get through it. That's, those are the subjects when you don't tend to retain the information too long. You know, you do the exam and then a day later, it's like out the back door. <laughs> Whereas there are probably subjects for you that you have deeply loved that, you know, you still remember some of the information to this day years later. And that's true for most people. So optimize your training and your learning and ideally your entire life <laughs> for enjoyment Yes, of course, there's goals that we're meaning to accomplish through our training and through all of the work that we do. There's objectives that we have and we have to show up and do the work, but the form that that work takes specifically, the specific exercises, the specific drills, the specific sequences and the design that you yourself create for it should be optimized for enjoyment, assuming those objectives are being reached through the thing, the methods that you use to reach those objectives. I know this is a bit of a mouthful here. So I had to add that in, okay? Remember the story of BJ Penn? Was it discipline? Was it, was it work ethic? No, it was fun. It was fun. And frankly, going from white belt to winning the world title in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in three years is absolutely obscene. That's one of the craziest things I've ever heard of <laughs> in sports, frankly. And it was fun. It was fun. That's the reason why. Okay. Kobe will say the exact same thing. If you go back through and study, he said, there's nowhere else I wanted to be. It didn't feel like a sacrifice. It didn't feel like the hard work that everybody said it was to me. I just didn't want to be anywhere else. <laughs> so optimize your training for enjoyment. You will learn everything so much faster. And this is such an important principle that I just had to add it here. Um, I know we've added like an extra 10 minutes to this talk, but I hope it was worth it for you. Please, please, please make sure that you're doing training that you love and optimizing it for your enjoyment. So that's it. We're done here. <laughs> Can't wait to see you in the next one. And be sure to reach out. Of course, I know I said this before, but reach out if you have any questions or comments or um, just want to give any feedback on your results with any of these, these techniques. I'd love to hear it. Hey, it's Taylor. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. And if you did, the best thing to do right now while it's fresh in your mind is head over to deepgame.com and take our free masterclass where you'll learn all eight laws of the deep game and all of the fundamentals of the part of basketball that's played with the mind. We've had players call this the best hour of basketball learning of their lives, and it's completely free right now. So head over to deepgame.com, take the masterclass, and I will see you there.